God is doing a lot of things here at Bethel, and we appreciate your continued help, your continued support of the church. And uh, summer has hit, uh, though maybe not tomorrow or the next day, but today it has. And so we'll go, we'll take it for what it is. And uh, we just want to praise the Lord today and lift up his name uh, with all that is going on. So would you pray with us? Lord, I thank you and praise you for all that you're doing in our lives. We ask, Lord, that you continue to lead and guide our church. Father, that you would um, watch over us and um, help us to be the church that you've called us to be. Father, I pray that it would be more than just an occasional, or excuse me, more than just a common thing that we do. <coughs> that, <coughs> that we would gather together to do the things that you've called us to do, to worship. That we would go out of here to make disciples. And that we'd work together to equip um, each other for the works that you have for us. And then, Lord, as you continue to open doors, that we might minister to the needs um, of others. We praise you in these things. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand up and join with us as we sing together? A lot of times you look at your life and you wonder how God can make anything out of our lives. There's times when we feel like, man, I'm such a mess. Why doesn't God just give up on me? 
but he does something beautiful. He turns beauty into ashes, and he turns graves into gardens.
next song that we're going to sing is, is an old hymn called There Is a Fountain. The gentleman that wrote it, his name is William Cooper. He was one of God's gracious gifts of those suffering from depression. Like the psalmist once cried, where are you, why are you cast down, O my soul? Cooper shows us that our emotional struggles often give us heightened sensitivity to the heart of God and to the need of others. He was born in 1731, was the fourth child of the British clergyman and his wife. Three of his siblings died, and then his mother died while giving birth to the fifth child. William was six when he lost his mother, and it was a blow from which he never recovered. Emotionally frail, he was sent to a boarding school where for two years he was terrorized by a bully, which further shattered his nerves. From the ages of 10 to 18, school was better, and he developed a love for literature and poetry. His father wanted him to be an attorney, but preparing for his bar exam, he experienced runaway anxiety. Concluding himself damned, he threw away his Bible and attempted suicide. He was committed to an asylum run by Dr. Nathaniel Cotton, and by God's grace, he was a lover of poetry and a committed Christian. Under his care, he slowly recovered. And in the asylum in 1764, when he found the Lord, he was reading Romans 3.25, whom God set forth as a pro, pro excuse me, propitiation by his blood through faith. His life was still on hold, many dark days to, to intense depression. Many years later, he was, uh, he met um, a fam, a man and his wife, Morley, um, Unwin, and they, they invited him to spend two weeks with them, and he ended up staying with them for 22 years. He took up gardening as a hobby, which helped ward off his depression. When they decided to move the village of Olney, a population of about 2,000, where John Newton was vicar. Many of you may know John Newton as the man who wrote Amazing Grace. A former slave trader, ex-scoundrel, he became a celebrated preacher, and he became fast friends with Newton. He began assisting John in his ministry, but when John moved, it was a further blow to his fragile sensitivities and to his depression. His depression was never far away through his entire life, and it intensified as he aged. Shortly before his death, he wrote The Castaway, in which he described himself as a sailor swept overboard into the Atlantic to perish. In this melancholia, William died on April 25th, 1800. There is a report, however, that on his deathbed, his face suddenly lit up as he exclaimed, I am not shut out of heaven after all. God can do amazing things even when you think he doesn't see you. This man who fought depression and the fact that God never loved him wrote the refrain, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. God can use anyone.
Father, we just ask this morning as we're here that, Lord, you'd meet us in a powerful way. We've already prayed this, but once again, we just ask. Father, I pray this morning as the message is shared that, Lord, you would just pour out your spirit in our midst. And, Lord, I pray that the words from your scriptures, from John and from Jeremiah, would just really ring true. Pray this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. A few kids, if you're interested in going to Children's Church, you can follow Miss Rochelle and Ashley. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to the book of John, chapter 7. So that's a New Testament book. It's the fourth gospel. We're looking at chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. I've always enjoyed summertime. And as we're beginning to experience these spring days, I know that summertime isn't far away. I have a lot of different fond memories of summertime. But I think one of my fondest, and I think I've shared this before, but was when I was a young man. I was probably in my mid-teens, and my dad had bought this old car, and it was a Rambler Ambassador. So we're going to go way back. 1965, red, two-door, convertible, black interior, white top, 327 V8 automatic. It was a sweet ride. One of the things, after much begging, my dad would allow me to do was to drive the car, which was awesome, from the driveway over to underneath the tree in the front yard where I could wash the car and just enjoy it. Now, maybe, unofficially, it might have found its way down the road and back. But I had to do that before because we had a dirt road. And so down the road and back, wash the car. Dad never knew. I think he knew. But it was a phenomenal memory that I've kind of tucked away. I can remember when it was all said and done, I'd sit out there and drink an iced tea under the tree and, and just really enjoy that summer day. Those things are burned in my memory. I think you probably have some things like that that are burned in your memory. I can just remember after working out there and sweating and even though I was getting wet washing the car, just the, the refreshingness of that cold iced tea on that hot summer day. It's hard to turn down something good and cold to drink when you're warm and really need something. In John chapter 7, John writes, starting at verse 37, going through 39, and this morning this is from the New Living Translation, on the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. When he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered his glory. Though it is natural for us to be refreshed physically by quenching our thirst, it is not natural for us to be spiritually refreshed. Our old sinful nature fights against this, but God's desire is that his people would be spiritually refreshed. Not just a little bit, but in a new way, finding a new source of strength in him. Because it is truly, he truly is our only source of strength. So let's look at an old problem, an old problem that has gone way back to the very beginning, right after people sinned. Now we're going to turn to Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah also. If you want to, you can keep your finger in John chapter 7 there. Flip back over, <coughs> excuse me, to Jeremiah. 
And we're going to be looking at verse, chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. Jeremiah here records, Has any nation ever traded its gods for new ones? Even though they are not gods at all, yet my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. The heavens are shocked at such a thing and shrink back in horror and dismay, says the Lord. For my people have done two evil things. Note these. Number one, they have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. Now I looked to kind of get an idea of the difference between living water and this water from a cistern, even a cracked cistern, but even from a cistern, what is the difference between living water? What is so special about living water? You see, Jesus used it referring to the Spirit as being refreshed, but what is the difference between stagnant water and living water? Well, living water has a source that comes down the mountain. It's pure. It's refreshing. As opposed to stagnant stagnant cisterns or pools or marshes. So in the hot countries of the east, when one is looking to be refreshed and to get his thirst quenched, um, it can be experienced by living water. <coughs> you have to understand that stagnant water has all kinds of things in it. I just want you to imagine what it's like. We have a little hobby farm. It's nothing much over there. But I can tell you what stagnant water looks like. Now, there are times out there when, like in the spring, we have all this water that comes and it collects in pools. And my ducks love to play in the water. And they're not very proper about it. And they muddle around in there and stir up the mud and do other things in the water. And then they drink the water. And it's just not right. But in the old days, they would collect water in cisterns. And in those cisterns, it was easy for things to get in there. And it was important that you sterilize that water because things fell in there. Bugs. Mice, rats, other things fell into that water and it needed to be purified. Right now, I need a volunteer. Josh, thanks for volunteering. Come on up here, man. I am excited because you look warm this morning and I have a present for you, my friend. Wonderful. I have this beautiful water here. Now, just because I don't want you to think that I'm up to something, I'm going to pour from the same pitcher, and we're going to just enjoy a little bit of water here. It's pretty good, country water from a well. That's pretty neat, yeah. Well, Dory... I have some other water here. She volunteers. <laughs> Anybody? Thank you. You don't want any. Oh, no, okay. Because there's some... There's some stuff. Nobody. You don't want any stagnant water? Look, just a little floaties in here. Nothing much. No, Steve? <laughs> All set, man. I got one hanging on here, even. I'm trying to, uh, off yeah, trying to cut back. There is a difference between living water and stagnant water. And you can just see it right there, the difference even in color. When Jesus uses these tremendous um, ways in which 
he gets his point across, we can literally see it. It's a picture of what's going on. Number one, if you want to write these down the back of your bulletin, number one, don't abandon the spring of living water. Don't abandon the spring of living water. The Israelites had this going on and on again, forsaking the spring of living water, and then on top of it, digging their own cisterns. Let me tell you like this. You see, people today talk to me and say, you know, I'm okay. I, I, I'll, I'll make it. I'm doing all right. You know, I talk to people and they say, it's okay. You know, I'm, I'm glad you're into, the, into this Jesus thing and stuff, but I'm all right. That's called digging your own cistern, trying to make it through life on your own terms, on your own strength. But what happens is you're drinking this stuff why is that? Because when you're making it on your own terms, you're taking in the garbage of this world. This water one time was fresh. One time it was living water, but no longer. Now it's garbage. God compared the refreshment of the spring water but not just any water, that mountain fresh water. When I drove truck, I stopped one time at a, a little rest area, and I was able to, in the mountains of Tennessee or one of those beautiful <laughs> southern states, I was able to walk down in this mountain. They'd kind of cut through the mountain, and there was a a little river that was going through there. And when I got out of the truck, I could hear it. And I couldn't just ignore it. So I took a break. I shut down, signed off, and, and uh, I went down there and I found this beautiful little river going over the rocks. And you know how that sounds, right? Just rushing over these rocks and how pure it was. You could just see right through it. It just made you want to, you know, stick a cup right down there and drink. It was so pure. Jeremiah 17, 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who turn away from you will be disgraced. They will be buried in the dust of the earth for they have abandoned the Lord, the fountain of living water. Many times we find ourselves like the people of Israel. We choose to go our own way. We abandon the very source of living water. Let's take a look at what happens when Israel abandons the source of life. So number two. Or the second one is, why settle for yesterday's water? Why settle for yesterday's water? So the second sin of Israel in Jeremiah 2.13 is they're wanting to become a source of life <coughs> unto themselves. This is the same thing that Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. They wanted to become like God. They wanted to be the source of their very own life. In the second part of chapter 2, verse 13 in Jeremiah, he writes, And they've dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. When we begin to try to, uh, from our own strength, to do what God is supposed to do, who is all-powerful does, when we try to do those things, it always turns out pathetic. It always turns out not the way that we would want it to. God wants to be the source of our strength. In Exodus chapter 16, God provides manna and quail for his people. He wants to be our provider. He wants to take care of us. But some of us want to be a source of strength unto ourselves, not trusting in God. So not only did Jeremiah the prophet say that God's people were settling for stagnant water of a, uh, of a cistern, but they could not even provide the second 
rate refreshment of cistern water because their cisterns were broken. And that's important for us to understand. It's not just a matter that I don't get the best water. I don't, I, I, I don't even get the second best water. I don't get any. I don't get any. You see, we were created by God to stay connected with Him. And when we don't stay connected with Him, we begin to fade. We begin to find ourselves falling into complacency. It's just, it's good enough. I'm okay. And we don't chase after plugging in to Christ every day. I wonder if many of our churches and our people have settled for yesterday's water instead of today's living water from the spring of life. So many are walking away from the truth of Jesus. Let me tell you, when you commit to following Christ, He will be the source of your strength. So you are invited to drink from living water every day. He wants to be the source of your strength that pours into you The refreshment. You see, Jesus sat down on the edge of a well in Samaria, and he talked to a Samaritan woman there who didn't understand when he was talking about living water. She was kind of a sketchy gal. She'd been through five husbands, and the one that she was with was not her husband. She was ostracized by society. She'd come out during the middle of the day because she always got so many questions and so so much harassment when she came out with the other ladies. But Jesus talked to her. Jesus shared with her the hope that there was in him. She tried to avoid conversation with him. She tried to give him all sorts of excuses. But Jesus revealed to her that he was the true source. He was the Messiah. He's the one that was promised. Number three, you're invited to drink of living water. Isaiah 55 says, Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink. Even if you have no money, come take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. The living water wants to provide for you physically. John chapter 4, verses 13 through 14. Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I will give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So Jesus is our only source. He's the only source. The one that fills you, are you feeling empty? Are you feeling discouraged? Are you depressed? Are you frustrated? He's the one that will fill you back up. He's the one that gives you hope. He's the one that calms your anxiety. He's the one that will walk with you and out of depression. Revelation chapter 7, verse 17, John writes, For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. 
He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Skip ahead to Revelation chapter 21, verses 6 and 7. John writes again, he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Here it is. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all of this, and I will be his God and he will be my son. Folks, it's not about trying harder. It's not about doing it your way. It's not about working for you. It's not about not working for you. Listen, do you hear the offer clearly? We're not talking about just salvation. But we're talking about refreshment. Soon you're going to experience the heat of Michigan. Soon you're going to experience the humidity. Soon you're going to be wondering and waiting for cooler weather. And there's going to be those days where you just can't seem to drink enough because it pours out of every place in your body as you sweat. You see, that happens spiritually too. The things of this world, the things of this life wear you down. The things of this life drag you down and pull out of you and suck out of you life spiritually. Number four, you're offered the power of of living water. You see, there's more than just trusting Jesus as the promised Messiah. He's more than just life insurance or fire insurance. Jesus is our all in all. He's the one whom I trust daily, the one in whom we talk to daily. The promised power that the disciples were promised came in Acts chapter 2. When the Holy Spirit was poured out on all believers, both Jew and Gentile, meaning those who were Jews and those who were not Jews. In Isaiah chapter 44, verses 3 through 4, Isaiah writes, For I will pour out water to quench your thirst and to irrigate your parched fields. And, here it is, I will pour out my Spirit on your descendants, And my blessings on your children, they will thrive like watered grass, like willows on a riverbank. In Acts chapter 1-8, it's very clear. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my what? Witnesses. Telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You see, we're back full circle to John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. I want to read specifically the center part of that verse. Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow out from his heart. I know I haven't been my normal dramatic self this morning, and that's okay. I admit to being on cold medicine, so I'm a little foggy. But I'm going to hand you something here that isn't a little foggy. It's completely clear. It is an invitation from Jesus Christ. It is so clear. You may be discouraged this morning. Your spiritual life may really be 
in the pits. You may be depressed. You may be tied up with things that you can't even figure out. Finances may be worrying you, your future. But I want you to hear this. Revelation 22, 17. Jesus says, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears this say, come. Let anyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who desires to drink freely from the water of life. Today I pray that you will hear clearly the call of Christ to quit drinking. Stagnant water. You see, what's in this cup was not meant for your consumption, folks. The stagnant waters of immorality. The stagnant waters of lies and deceit. The stagnant waters of pornography, of unbelief, of religion, of complacency of hypocrisy, and so many more. This is not for you. Stop drinking it. This this he offers you. The spirit and the bride, they say, come. It's been a bit since we opened the altars up. And I know we have less than half of the people we had last week. But maybe today, you needed to hear this. Maybe you've been drinking garbage. I have one clean glass left. And I offer it to you. As our worship team comes, I want to encourage you that if you just need to come and talk to Jesus, just come, kneel, drink, understand that He wants to fill you with the clean living water that only comes from Him.
Father, we praise you for meeting us here today. Lord, we just can praise you for so many things, but God, I thank you for meeting us. And I pray that your spirit would speak to our spirit and lead us in the ways that we should go. We pray all these things in your precious and holy name today. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.